but just, just as, as well. well. Because, because many of you are interested in East Asia. Asia. Many of you are interested in the new realities of East Asia. Asia. My problem is there have been so many interests in East Asia and ASEAN that I just could not keep up with the invitation. Another problem is some of you in the audience have been listening to me for the last two years. Ambassador Lisa Pan here, Charles Morrison himself, Gary from the Nation Review, and many of you. So it is very, very difficult to come up with anything brilliant and new about East Asia. Nevertheless, personally, the real shift from east to west, or the weight that has just been given to the east came to me in October 2008. In the great hall of the people of China, during the summit of the Asia-Europe meeting, where Mr. Barroso, Madame Merkel, Mr. Sarkozy, Mr. Bolosoni, and the rest from Europe came to pay him for the ASEM meeting. And you remember that October, October 2008 was the beginning and almost the depth of the crisis unfolding. And all of them from Europe appealed on one of those. Please, China, please keep it going. Please keep it going. Please help us and pull us out of this crisis. David Mellon, representing the UK, pulled me aside and said, Mr. Secretary General, this is very, very ironic indeed. That we from the free market, we from the West, here appealing for China to help. And of all the places in the great hall of the people of China, the seats of the Communist Party of China. To me, that was the real shift. Now, since then, I think you would agree that East Asia has not disappointed the world. Whether it's because of the large stimulus package, packages, in the region, whether because it's the management ability of these countries, of these leaders, whether it is because of the large foreign exchange reserves and reserves that we have together in East Asia that we could do out to cushion the impact from the West. We have been able to protect ourselves, cushion ourselves, and to emerge out of the crisis quicker and faster than the rest of the world. So, precisely because of that expectation, precisely because of that appeal, and the importance of East Asia from now on to the global economy and everywhere else, There is this question lingering in every capital of the world if they are that important, if they are that influential, if they are that capable, can they cope? Can the existing mechanisms in East Asia and Pacific respond to the challenges natural and Man made that could occur. In Northeast Asia, the tsunami, the earthquake, the pandemic, or economic downturn. What if the entire East Asia model of economic management just went past? 
What would happen? Wouldn't the world be suffering with this issue? Well, some of us interpreted that question as trying to look down on this issue. Many of us took that question as a challenge. And in fact, as a mirror image of a world of, a world of confidence, because we are so important, we are worried that we cannot cope, or that the mechanisms that we have are not inclusive enough, are not overarching enough, are not effective enough. We in East Asia understand. And we know that Henry Kissinger, last century, sounds like a long time ago, last century made this remark that East Asia, as far as the economy is concerned, as far as innovation is concerned, as far as economic growth is concerned, is 20th century Europe. But as far as institutions, to manage their problems in the region, among the felt, it is 19th century Europe. We understand that totally. And that's where ASEAN came in. A group of small and medium sized powers or states loosely strung together since 1967 and has been growing quite steadily. 1.5 trillion combined GDP, 1.7 trillion combined trade with the world. And out of that, 26, 27 percent among ourselves still low, but we're working on it. ASEAN began in a different pattern than the EU or than NAFTA. The EU began with the economy of France and Germany, strong, combined, and attract the rest into the Europe. NAFTA began the US economy, the largest economy in the world. Canada joined Mexico and Iraq. ASEAN is the reverse. ASEAN began with a very loosely structured, rather informal core in the middle but through the years, we have been able to bring the stronger periphery to work with us through what we call dialogue partnership. So Japan, Korea, China, India, Australia, including the US, Russia, Canada, India, all came in to be connected with ASEAN. And with a stronger periphery, we have been able to serve as, I would call, a fulcrum of power players in the region. Because the periphery has problems among themselves, because the periphery, peripheral states, have historical baggage between and among themselves. For the last three, four decades, ASEAN has been able to serve as the centerpiece, the core. But we realize that also that this cannot be the case for them. That this cannot be the situation long into the future. Because there will be time where those political states find themselves closer, more ready, and more willing to work with each other. And ASEAN may lose its centrality. 
So, we are embarking on our own consolidation, connectivity, infrastructure connectivity, institutional connectivity, markets, financial institutions, customs, immigration, movement of skilled people, and then people to people, 592 million of them visiting, moving, exchanging with the other cross-border investment among ourselves. We are working on one market. We are working on one competitive market. We are working on one equitable market for all the people. We are working on an integration into the global marketplace. So, in order to help East Asia grow, in order to help East Asia evolve into a more effective community, small secret, ASEAN is providing that spearheading that leadership forward because we are effective and we accommodate all. There's a new idea coming out of the Southwest Pacific, of the APC, Asia Pacific Community. For fear that the existing structures will be passed in the middle and not anywhere. There's another idea coming from North East Asia, East Asia Community, for fear that what exists is not adequate. ASEAN is providing initiatives and direction. We have set up what we call the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization, a swap arrangement that will be open for all to subscribe to 120 billion US dollars. For those countries who may have problems on their current economic deficit, who may have problems on their foreign exchange, reserve, that they can apply to this 120 billion US dollars. 13 countries working together, ASEAN, China, Japan, and During the negotiation on who would pay how much into that 120 million fund, we had one big problem. And that was the problem of between China and Japan, who should contribute more between themselves. Japan said we are the second largest economy, we cannot let China contribute to that fund more than that. China said, we are becoming the largest. We are the largest country, the only country in the G5. At the UN, we cannot let Japan contribute more than in China. Two of them fighting over who should give more. I think that's the problem that any region in the world would like to have. So we have 120 billion US dollars, what we call multilateralization swap arrangements. The office to monitor these economies, whether they are entitled to, whether they are in trouble, whether they are in need of this fund or not, has now been decided it's going to be in Singapore. That is one economic financial institution that we have set up. It's not going to take away the role of the IF. It's not going to answer the global community's problems of shortage 
of resources to manage your economies, but it is going to be a relief that at least there is some fund somewhere where they can take care of themselves in East Asia, and that will be good. And this is something like President Wu, Kim Kao of China has been saying, if China can help itself, it's already can help the world. East Asia is thinking the same. On the political and security, Charles Morris is interested in this, and how to When Mrs. Clinton was the East West Senator, she raised the issue of multilateral arrangements in the Asia Pacific. Again, reflecting that statement by the Middle East that they are the 19th century Europe. So, what are we going to do? The US has traditional treaty allies with many countries in the Pacific. But the Pacific and Asia are wide, are diverse, are full of problems that maybe the traditional allies as it exists are not going to be able to deal with. She has expressed her in multilateral religions. Can some of them be expanded, be embarrassed? Can some of them be reformed? I'm not using that word as coming from outside and trying to reform what we have inside. But rethink so that we can answer and respond to that lingering doubt can East Asia cope? Well, the leaders of ASEAN last month decided, early this month, sorry, in Hanoi, that there are some architectures already in existence under the ASEAN leadership that could be expanded, could be reconfigured. Now 16, 10 plus Australia, New Zealand, India, China, Japan, Korea, and ASEAN. 16. Russia has expressed interest from the beginning. Would the US be interested? Or would the US be interested in some form of association? with a mechanism like EAS at the summit level 16. Would it be 16 plus 2? Or would it be 10 plus 8? ASEAN plus the rest. Would that answer the question, can East Asia cope? Because there are these major powers legitimate in the Asia-Pacific region, now under one umbrella. No country has been excluded, no country has been included at this moment, just an exercise that the foreign ministers and the senior officials will be thinking about of how to ensure that the world will have confidence in East Asia because East Asia has institutions that could respond to any challenges, any calamity in East Asia, to East Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, the new realities in East Asia are multi-dimensional. Certainly sustained economic growth. Certainly 
these countries, countries are trying, trying to find ways and processes to work out differences, differences among themselves. themselves. Trying to bury their historical animosities back in and looking into the future whether or not they can work together in order to sustain the growth, the rapid growth, the fast growth, and at the same time make sure that the growth is equitable. There will be social peace and social harmony. There won't be any conflicts, there won't be any tension. Or if there are, they will be manageable. A new reality in East Asia is the US has shown much more interest and willingness to engage. The first trip to East Asia from Madame Clinton to, to the world outside, foreign trip, was to East Asia. She came to Jakarta, she came to the Secretariat, and she promised that she would attend our ASEAN Regional Forum, our ASEAN Foreign Minister's meeting, July 2009, and that she would look into the possibility of the U.S. succeeding to our treaty of amity and cooperation. July came, she did all. I told her, now, there's a change that we can do with. But we also charged her that under President, President Bush, the summit with the East, with the ASEAN countries, has been postponed, had been postponed three times. If you can deliver that, Madam, we will really believe in the change you have brought. She turned back to your main speaker tonight, Mr. Kurt Campbell, and said, let's do it. And by gosh, she did. In Singapore, at the end of the APEC meeting, last November, Mr. Obama and the ASEAN leaders met for the first time, now looking for opportunity to do the same. That re-engagement of the U.S., the re-interest of the U.S. in the region is welcome. Because it is healthy. And I heard the counselor of China, Mr. Dai Jingguo, at the level of the Deputy Prime Minister, said at the Secretariat in his lecture that we welcome the U.S. engagement in East Asia, that we neither have the intention or the capacity to push the U.S. away from the region. But let me, let me put this up. Maybe this is something that we can think about. The rivalry between the U.S. and China is not going to be economic. It's not going to be the revaluation of the UN. No. The rivalry will be geopolitical, and the center stage will be Southeast Because Southeast Asia is sitting between the two giants, India and China. Because 85% of energy sources for East Asia, China, Japan, and Korea, President Yi Moon Bak said, 85% of our energy 
either come from Southeast Asia or come through Southeast Asia. So, for us, Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian waters, South China Sea, must be safe, must be secure, must be stable. And there are mechanisms to make sure that they are so safe, secure, and stable. But the countries of Southeast Asia are still will be a contesting ground between these two giants. Question asked, are we worried? My answer is we have been through many of these contests before in the past. We have developed experiences how to handle how to adapt and how to manage major super power rivalries in the region in this. Just as the way we manage the power plays in the region through our dialogue partnership network. These are some of the living realities. In East Asia, U.S. can come in, U.S. is welcome, but the U.S. must also realize that the terrain has changed. As Madame Clinton put it at the East West Center lecture, there is a sea change in East Asia, and the U.S. must recognize that. Coming in, work with the existing mechanisms, with the existing powers, with the existing arrangements. And ASEAN can be that instrument to mediate the power plays, not only between the US and China, but the US. In, In fact, fact, the Defense Minister, Minister Deputy, Deputy Prime, Prime Minister, Minister of Singapore, Singapore put it just that way, that ASEAN can be helpful in the U.S.-China relationship. So, so ladies and gentlemen, clearly from the member of the media, because the realities have changed. What I would like to see into the future so that the world is confident and comfortable is that we have an informed core of media representatives reporting the region. And for that, let me quote an American playwright, Arthur Miller. Who said about newspapers? He said a newspaper is a nation talking to itself. I guess you could say that Google is a nation talking to itself now, or the global community talking to itself. What I like to see is a core of competent reporters reading and reporting the realities of East Asia, talking to each other, reflecting the realities of East Asia effectively, objectively, as much as you can because you are here, because the world wants to hear from you. So, Mr. Morrison, alumni newly inducted alumni that you have here could help make sure that East Asia talked to itself through your reporting, to your contribution, to your, through your research, through your analysis. Thank you very much.
the purpose of this uh, whole program be helpful. Now what I'd like to do is take about two or three questions. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll do it again as we did in, in the morning session. I'll take the questions and then I'll respond to all of them together. And the first one we do, sir. I think it's a symbol of recognition 
that ASEAN has become a force in the region that could work with the wider region that have some experiences that could contribute and share with the rest of the world. We welcome that recognition. On the issue of Myanmar, which is the same issue as interference, which is the same issue as the border issue between Thailand and Cambodia, ASEAN is a collection of 10 countries with tremendous diversity in the world. The fact that we need to set up the regional mechanism for the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights at all is an achievement. And according to the Charter, two words on that promotion and protection. And it took us a long time to do it, whether to emphasize on protection with the right, the right to investigate or promotion in the end they do both and they will give you the term of reference in five years. Now, for those who want us to hurry, I have this appeal. I will repeat to you what I said to Secretary Hillary Clinton at the Secretary in February 2009. She said, how much do you intend to implement this charter? And I knew exactly from where she came from with that question. Meaning, I said, I'm probably not going to be serious about what you were saying. I'm probably going to commit yourself to do charter, international treaty, sign, seal, ratify. But I said, but now, Secretary General, we have to make it a living document. Much like your Declaration of Independence, Charles, I remember this before. When Thomas Jefferson penned down that very important phrase, all men are created equal, endowed with unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he did not include war. He did not include the Indians, he did not include the blacks, he did not include men, white, wasps, without property. But every successive generation of the American people appealed to that document. Whether it's Martin Luther King, or before him, or Mr. Johnson, trying to create the great society, or Robert Kennedy, appeal to that phrase, which was posted over 200 years ago, almost 300. And the women of America got their vote only in the 1920s. If ASEAN can make this a working document, a living document, including our human rights commission, then they give us a chance. The border between Thailand and, and, and Cambodia, they would like to keep the issue bilateral among themselves. We urge them to solve the problems among yourselves so that it won't punish and impact and erode the image and the profile of ASEAN in the international arena. At least it has not gone up to a full world war. When are we going to get rid of this kind of interference? I don't think we will. To tell you the truth, it's part of the United Nations target. What I have tried in the past was, let's not make it rigid. That anything at all about the next neighbor is considered interference. President of the Roman Valley, the late President of the Roman Valley, came to a summit in Manila, sat down 
among his colleagues and said, I know you're worried about Ajit. I know you're worried about East Timor. Let me tell you about Ajit and East Timor. You don't have to ask so that there is no interference. Well, now ASEAN are talking to each other much more openly, much more candidly. Before you couldn't even ask it. Of course, there is a new idea. Responsibility to protect. If the state, the government cannot protect their own citizens or be party to genocide, crime against humanity, the international community shall have the responsibility to protect. That is gaining currency. Let that gain currency further. We realize that there is no domestic issue that can remain domestic forever or for too long. At one point, you will have to overflow. And we have it. For the situation in Myanmar, a member state, it has been a problem. It is a problem. Everybody knows it. The leaders know it. The ministers know it. And we all wish that the seven steps forward, the last one, the elections, are going to be that final step that would lead to true national reconciliation. And we all wish that it's going to be inclusive, it's going to be credible, it's going to be transparent. But again, we cannot impose. And if you ask me, not all ASEAN countries have the experiences of democracy. Is that adversity? We all offer help, we all offer assistance, we all offer experiences, but if Myanmar does not want, what can we do? I wish, personally, not as ASEAN Secretary General, that all the opposition parties would join. Because at least, having joined, there will be a new status status of having joined, having run, having lost, and with that credibility of, with that right to observe, to suggest, to criticize, it has to begin somewhere. It is unfortunate that they have decided not to. But it is not for us to say, you have to. I know that there was a lot of expectation on us here, but it can do so much. It can deliver so much. It is not a magic wand that can deliver a miracle on every issue. But at least, it has been maintaining a relative peace for the region. It has been maintaining growth for the region. It has been attract, att attracting investments into the region. 60 billion in 2008. Majority of them is from the EU. The US came third, fourth. Japan, and uh, from within ASEAN, we have been able to maintain peace and growth. And now we have over 40 ambassadors accredited to ASEAN working with us in Jakarta, also a sign of confidence that ASEAN is going somewhere. U.S., China, and Japan are exploring independent missions in Jakarta, not with the embassies bilateral to the Republic of Indonesia, a sign of recognition. But we can't deliver miracle on everything. And I think all around the world, the operating principle is if ASEAN succeeds, in its vision and mission, 
at least the world will have one less region to worry about. They can take care of themselves. And I think that is the contribution to the world. Thank you very much. Here's uh, Dr. Schneider quite regularly, both on the record and uh, off the record. And I've told him this before, but I have never, ever been bored by one of his speeches. Early in my career, I worked as a Senate aide, and I can truly say that uh, he's more than a map for any senator I ever knew. Uh, 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 he gave uh, this speech without notes uh, in a language that was not his native language uh, on the record and with 10 or 13 or 16 or 18 governments looking over their shoulder. And he gave us a very eloquent, coherent, uh, and very interesting statement. So I want all of you, alumni of the East West Center, to thank our alumnus, Sir Fitzgerald.